Welcome to the Stories in EDU podcast, the show where we talk with real educators and hear their powerful impact. Their stories will grab you, inspire you, and show you the reach of the work we do. And now, the Bretzman Group presents your hosts, Josh Gauthier and Mandy Taylor. Welcome back to another episode of the Stories in EDU podcast, the podcast where you get to hear great stories from a variety of educators about things that they've experienced uh, out in their careers. Um, and man, uh, it is just awesome to, to be able to hear all of these. And um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful that we can continue to do this. And there's so many educators out there uh, that have great stories. So if you're one of them, feel free to contact us. We'd love to have you on the podcast. You can reach out to uh, myself at Mr. G Fact of the Day on Twitter uh, or at gmail.com for my email. And uh, you can also reach out to my co-host, Mandy, at Mandy M. Taylor on Twitter. And uh, we're going to bring her in to see how she's doing. Mandy, how you doing? Hi, Josh. I'm great. I'm actually getting that like sleepy. So I've been at TCEA this uh, week in Austin, um, the Texas Computer Computer Education Association Conference. So Monday presented, Tuesday presented, Wednesday this morning presented. So I'm getting to the point where I'm like, at that very like I'm about to crash so tomorrow morning is my last presentation and then get to hang out tomorrow and then that'll kind of wrap it up but um, I've had a great week of just getting to connect with people that I've only met on Twitter and then just other people that you know I know and I'm just learning so many things but um, I'm so excited tonight to um, talk with Nick and hear more about um, his journey with maker ed because that is such a hot topic at tcea so really excited to hear about some of that but um like you were talking earlier about people reaching out to us and i actually printed a map of um the united states and i think our goal could be to try to get someone on the podcast from every state because i think that would be a neat way to get that perspective, you know, of all the great things that are going on across the country. So I'm going to start filling those in with my silly sense markers as we have that. I guess I should probably do it in a fun techie way, but sometimes I like markers. <laughs> Analog works too. Uh, that's so awesome that you're doing that. And I think uh, that'd be kind of cool to be able to say, hey, uh, I want to hear what education is like in Alaska or how did you even end up in Alaska to teach? Um, that'll be fun if we can connect with somebody up there. Sounds uh, great. But, but without further ado, our, our guest tonight mm. is Nick Giacobbe from the Chicago area. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Good evening. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, certainly. So uh, I am a special education teacher in the Chicago Public Schools. I teach at Burley School, uh, which is in the Lakeview neighborhood. Uh, the, the notable landmark in Lakeview is, of course, Wrigley Field, uh, a little bit to the east of us. And I'm in my 11th year there. Uh, this current year, I'm teaching 7th and 8th grade math, but I've taught uh, K through 8 there, I guess, now. So that's pretty exciting for me to have that new group this year. Uh, I'm a Google certified innovator, uh, cl class of 2012, <laughs> yay, Jitachi, uh, and a Seesaw ambassador, and I'm happy to be here. Um, so talk to me about, I always write down and as people are saying things, things that I've I'm interested in knowing more about. So how does, how, what are some of the ways that you utilize Seesaw with middle school kiddos? Ah. Um, I work with elementary kids and a lot of our teachers use it, but um, I'm just curious about specifically what you, how you use that with the older kids. Uh, well, there's the, the basic stuff, which is uh, screencasting. So for instance, in math, they can work out a problem and then share their thinking throughout the process, which is sort of like the base level of what you can do with it. Right. But what I, what really excites me is when I can sort of add that special spice of constructionism, which is an educational theory uh, created by Seymour Papert. And if it's, if you sort of dumb it down to its purest essence, 
It's the idea that students learn best when they can have peer discussions amongst themselves about mm -hmm. an object that they've created. So what's great about Seesaw is that the students can create something, share it out, and then have these uh, conversations about their design choices asynchronously. Mm -hmm. And Seesaw, you can record it and then share it in the feed. And then you can have your critique group, which is a few of your peers from your classmates, give you ideas about what you've done. And of course, it requires a lot of scaffolding to get the kind of responses that right. you want. Sure. But it, it's a really powerful tool. And I've used it uh, with as young as third grade up through eighth grade. And it's okay. really blown well, my mind. Um, I was sorry to interrupt you. My um, son has taken a STEM class in middle school. I think they call it GTT, Gateway to Technology. Um, but it sounds to me like the things that they talk about are um, they do a lot of construction projects, a lot of project-based learning. And so his teacher will take pictures of the things they're doing in class. And um, I get to kind of see those things through his, through my parents' he saw account and see the things that they do. But I'm not sure that they've used the tools where they are communicating. They use Google. I know a lot to collaborate and things like that. Um, but I'm just kind of always interested in which tools people were people are using and then which one works best in different situations because I think sometimes this one works better for this and so um, I, I'm fascinated too what you were talking about with constructivism constructionism as you said yes okay because um, as an I am an early childhood um, specialist and so that part when I think of constructivism about building meaning from um, play and experiences and things like that. I think this is a little bit different, but it kind of sounds like it's rooted in the same idea, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And actually, uh, Papert worked with Piaget. Okay. And so it's just a branch off of that tree. Okay. Well, that'll be fun to look up <laughs> later. There's a lot of great stuff on Seymour Papert, and Nick is, is much more of an expert, and I still need to get myself some some literature uh, about about Papert. It's been one of my goals is to learn a little bit more about um, his thinking and his ideas that uh, whenever I, I read stuff, it always seems like it feels like it could have been written yesterday. Um, right. You know, talking about the state of things and where they could be and where they should be as it relates to children and computing and, and what learning could and should look like, um, which, is, which is really fascinating. And um, you got to really dive into that universe, Nick, uh, quite quite extensively not too long ago. Is that, uh, that correct? Yes, I did. So uh, I, I was able to go away for a sabbatical for one year back in 2014 and uh, attend the Harvard Graduate School of Education to earn a master's in technology, innovation, and education. And while I was there, I got to take classes uh, with Karen Brennan, who's a recent graduate of uh, MIT's Media Lab. And she got her PhD working in the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab, uh, mm -hmm. or with the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, uh, headed by Mitch Resnick, who, and Papert was the founder of that group. So constructionism is at the core of the work that she does. And it was amazing to see that work. And what I'm particularly passionate about myself is trying to bring that constructionist idea to a public neighborhood school. Um, and w where are you at with that? Have you had uh, projects that you would consider a successful iteration on that idea and, and something that you would say, I think this is a good starting point, or this is something that, that I think is a, a good representation of what constructionism can look like in a school? Yeah, for sure. I think I'll actually work from the present backwards since Mandy asked about uh, how it works with middle school students. So what we're doing right mm -hmm. now uh, in the middle school is the first 10 minutes of math class each day is what we call a soft start. And that's based off of the work of uh, Smokey Daniels. And the idea mm -hmm. is that students have that independent time. So it's kind of like genius hour, but they get 10 minutes of it each day and they get to explore what they're personally passionate about and the way that we sort of monitor their progress and for them to give each other a bit of feedback 
is they keep track of it in a Google slide deck, and we call that the design journal. That was something I picked up from Karen Brennan's class when I was at Harvard, is the Google slides are an amazing tool to track thinking, and as you iterate and pivot all of your previous weeks of work, it's still in the slide deck, so it's cool to watch how a project progresses. And so recently I had a group of students who made it their task to, uh, their inquiry question was, what does it take to make a great film? And so they spent a little bit of time researching different shots. What's a long shot? What's a tracking shot? What's the cowboy shot? What's the close up, mm -hmm. right? And they, they learned how to shoot a film and they got to work with my somewhat busted iPhone. <laughs> but, they managed to create a film that won grand prize for their grade level at the local uh, Google Educator Group Chicago Film Festival. That's awesome. And Ooh. yeah, I know, kudos to them. They really created a masterful piece of film. And at the core of it was the idea that everything was in beta, everything could be a mistake, and each day they just took it as it came. And so they started out, the theme for their film was, uh, what is it like to be in someone else's shoes? And so their original script treatment was they wanted to film, what is it like for an immigrant student in the current political climate? What is it like to be in their shoes? And they filmed some of it and they noticed that the bullying scenes were really sticking out and the rest of it was sort of okay, but it was hard with no production value to make that mm -hmm. stuff look great. So then they thought, oh, well, we're all really into shoes, as middle schoolers are, right. so why don't we make it focused? Well, it's about shoes, and child labor's a big issue, so let's make it about child labor. And once again, we ran into the same problem that the bullying footage looked phenomenal, and the child labor stuff looked like kids playing with shoes and boxes in the basement right. school. So they finally pivoted to bullying as an overarching theme, and they were able to just do a few quick reshoots at the end, uh, add music, and boom, it was all right there. And having that sort of trail of breadcrumbs left in their slide deck really tells the story of where they came from and how much they grew over the seven weeks. That's, it's really fascinating. Um, I've noticed a couple of times you've used the word pivot, and I wonder if you're using that because, is it intentionally, be, is it intentional because you've learned that as part of this process, or is it just a word you like? Because what I'm wondering is, is I keep, I'm struck by you keep, the almost even the way that you're moving when you say it it's not wow. like they're like that idea sucks we can't do it we're going to do this or that's a bad idea that kind of in this idea of design thinking whether it is poetry or making something designing a project a video writing a song that very often it's these little huh well let's see let me try this well no that didn't work i'm gonna and i think that that idea of pivoting is interesting because it's not scrapping and starting from the very beginning each time. It's just kind of these little, um, little changes that are happening. I'm wondering if that's intentional or if that's a process or where all of that's coming from. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I definitely dig the word. Um, <laughs> and I I'm really all about the students tweaking it and playing with what they've created. And right. having a digital format makes it much easier than if they were, you know, carving something out of marble, right? Sure. Where, where an oops is like, oh, we're done. Right. Uh, and I, I'd probably say there's, they made a two and a half minute film, and I'd argue we probably have somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes of outtakes on my laptop. Right. Shots that didn't work, shots that were really, really good that were in the original version that then they looked back at and they said, you know, something about this doesn't feel right in the way that the rest of it's constructed. Let's go back and try this a different way or let's try mm -hmm. a different angle. And there's one scene and it's the where the 
film sort of turns where the child who's been bullied throughout the the show uh the student who comes to him and then offers him a hand and he thinks the kid's gonna punch him but he's actually a friend who picks him up and then they walk away the evolution of just that shot because originally they were shooting it from the side and then it became a series of shots where it was looking at the looking down at the child who's been bullied and then his lens of looking up at this child and it's a really sort of foreboding and they made sure the lighting was such that it he right. really sort of looms and makes you feel small and then he offers the hand and everything works out mm -hmm. and then well, once they found that piece they changed the they sunk the music up so that right at that moment that's when it goes into a major key in the music right to reinforce the idea and it's all them like oh well it, the music changes here so then they trimmed some other scenes so that it would just hit just at that right moment mm -hmm. So there's a there's so much written like I've, I'm already like filled here, but um, so I'm struck too by the power of the actual like steam, you know that every it was we had stem and then it went to steam and now they're at you know like the the idea of how the art of the filmmaking and the music is going along with the writing and the script and and that it all is hitting so many different actual standards that that mm -hmm. the kids are uh, being asked to do but in a way that's highly relevant to their the the lives that they're living right now it's relevant to them politically it is meaningful to them in like their the, the spiritual part of it there's so many different things that are kind of converging instead of saying today we're going to talk about the power of um you know music at the right place in a in a piece or something like that you know it's kind of the and you said this is in the beginning of your math class yeah this is this is algebra <laughs> yeah so i mean like i've um it's just a, it's just so um i think fantastic to to recognize the power of that 10 minutes each day that you are basically giving of your instructional time but the payoff that you're getting not only in what the kids are able to come up with but just how what they're learning through that process so that's such a it's so powerful that you recognize it and then are honoring that um with the kiddos um angela stockman has written a book called make writing and it's about a writing makerspace and she talks about how, um, because I work with a writing project, and so I'm always fascinated how we can better reach our reluctant writers. And, and she's, her idea right now is, you know, with this big maker movement, that maybe these kids that really struggle with, writer, with writing are makers. And if we can get them interested in this process, then we can see how it can translate into writing. And so this project that you're talking about kind of sounds like that, um, that, that idea of really just looking at something from so many different angles. It's just really, really fascinating. Um, I'd love to, I want to see the video now. <laughs> I want to yeah, see their movie. Yeah, I can shoot you a link. It's on YouTube. Yeah. So something to go along with what you're saying is one of the things I really picked up from Karen Brennan in her class is that she spent a lot of time setting the conditions for open experimentation and play. And the, the thing which really struck me about her class was on the first day she said, okay, well, as far as grades are concerned, they, they make me nervous and I see them as a limiting factor. So from here on out, if you want an A, you now have an A. If you want a pass, you now have a pass. But <laughs> The other side of that is you are now the audience. So you don't have to satisfy me. You need to be satisfied with the work yourself. And I've been really intrigued <laughs> to try and discover how can I do that in a right. system where I have to assess and I have to grade, right? right. So how do I give students mm -hmm. that kind of autonomy and agency? 
And the soft start has really done that because some days it's more of a social time for the students to be sort of tribal and to socialize. Mm -hmm. But we found since we've done it, that the time spent in class, the remaining 50 minutes is, is so much more focused because they've had that time, which I right. think is developmentally appropriate for those eighth graders to get the time mm -hmm. to tinker around with their peers and then be ready for the work. I, I, am, I, I love that idea. And we've had some teachers tinker with Genius Hour and that type of thing, but I feel like the soft start has a lot of potential. I feel like in my mind, as you talk about it, it's an investment. You talk about setting the conditions. Um, you know, I go back to something that I read when I was first a teacher. I think it's, uh, I think it's actually right above me here on the desk. Uh, mm -hmm. Fred Jones' Tools for Teaching. I don't know if everybody's familiar, anybody's familiar with that one. But, uh, but in there, he talks about how, and I think this is reiterated in a lot of stuff that's come out since then. Um, you know, students often feel powerless in school, like it's everything's being done to them in school, and that if we want to teach them to, to respect things and, and, and be able to make good decisions, we have to give them things to respect and give them decisions to make uh, of which there are consequences in different things. And, and I think when you give them 10 minutes that is theirs, that they can choose to do something worthwhile that they care about with, um, you know, I think that that is totally going to open up the rest of their day for most kids because they get that part they get like you said th that developmentally appropriate part of the day that that their adolescence they need that opportunity to pursue some of that stuff because you know they they are the most important thing in their world at that point mm -hmm. um and we can either ignore it and try and 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 try sweep it under the rug and try and make it like it doesn't exist or we can you know, embrace it and find ways to make it work for us. And, you know, not every student's going to create gold like a, an award-winning film, but that wouldn't have happened at all if you didn't have this, right. the soft starts. You just gave those students this new entire perspective. And um, one thing I'm stuck with that, you know, I find as I experience more things in my personal life, um, you know, I, I go back to how much I appreciate something like baseball. Um, which goes back to I played baseball all through my youth and high school, a little bit in college. And so when I watch a baseball game, like there's a lot more going on in my head as I watch that game mm -hmm. than my wife sitting next to me who just thinks that one player looks, you know, cute in the pants and she wants to first <laughs> way. Like, you know, like that kind of stuff is, is like, like so like perspective changing that right. I know what it's like to have runners in the corners and nobody out how it feels to be a pitcher and 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 how that situation looks like and what he's trying to do and and it totally changes it for me and so when you think of these kids who researched all this film stuff and and worked so hard and saw that you know out of all this filming they did like one percent made it into the movie like every time they watch tv every time they watch netflix every time they watch a movie like they're going to be thinking of like, wow, I wonder, wonder how much they spent on that shot or that's a really good decision for that. Or hmm, I wonder if they would have filmed it that way. And all of a sudden, like that, that cognition, that metacognition, all these different things are happening there and, and they become more than just a consumer at that point. And, and I think that that's the most powerful part of that. And it's all I could think about when you said that was, I mean, those kids are eighth graders and I think their lens is now completely changed because of that opportunity. Well, and you just said the word lens, and that's what I kept thinking, because like when when Nick was talking initially, the things that I was writing down were the things that meant it was the lens I was viewing it with. I was like thinking of, I have an eighth grade son. He is taking algebra. These are things he likes. He enjoys music. I have an early childhood background, so I view things with an early childhood lens, you know, and so it's interesting how, and we talk about that with our young readers, like everybody's background knowledge and schema, it affects the way you interact with text, the way you work through the world. And so as much as we can broaden that background knowledge for everybody, the more entry points the learner has with whatever content we're teaching. And so it's just, it's so fascinating to think about how we can leverage um, our time, you know, what we do have control of to help kids make those connections. And it's not that they need us to do it for them. They just needed the space to be able to do it for themselves. And then, like you said, 
the the setting the condition setting the conditions is that what you said mm -hmm. um were you having to kind of set this is what it's going to how we're going to operate in that structure but then once they understood that you know there was so much that they could design themselves it's powerful it really is hmm. in, in thinking about uh sort of when i first got started with with tinkering with this stuff when i came back uh, there's one project which comes to mind, which I've shared the stories uh, with Josh uh, before, and that's we we're very fortunate at my school in that we have a music program where starting in fourth grade, uh, all of our students. Well, the music programs go starts in kindergarten, but it, it really gets formalized in fourth grade because students can either join the band or sing in the choir, and as an end of year field trip, everyone gets to go downtown and perform at Symphony Center, which is where the Chicago Symphony Orchestra performs. And so it's a really big day for the students. And whenever there's a big, exciting thing coming up, it it's sort of drives the conversation in the classroom. And I had some of my students ask me one day, sort of offhand, they were like, well, we're doing all this stuff with music, but where do instruments come from like who invented them and why are they designed the way that they are and i thought oh okay well maybe this is a question worthy of some inquiry so mm -hmm. we we spent a little bit of time over two days just doing research searching the web triangulating our sources trying to find out some history about the various instruments that they played and choral music and while it was somewhat fruitful it really didn't grab the students and some of them didn't find answers that they were hoping to find. So I thought, you know, why don't we take this a little bit further? So they had a field trip on Monday to go down and perform. And on Tuesday when they came back, I said, okay, well, what we're going to be doing is you guys are going to be designing your own instruments. And so we were following uh, Mitch Resnick's uh, creative learning spiral. So the first thing that you're going to do today is you're going to imagine and just imagine any kind of instrument that you can think of in your head that you would like to be able to play. Just imagine it. And then once you've got it, you're going to record and seesaw what it is that you imagine this instrument to be. And you can create a drawing or you can just think it up, but you need to share it. And then we'll break into critique groups and we'll talk amongst ourselves about what we've thought about. And so the first day they imagined the instrument. And then the next day they started creating it. And so the templates that they got to play with is they coded the instruments in scratch. Uh, they built it out of cardboard and copper tape and makey makeys. And they built it over a couple of days. And during each phase, they would sort of do a check in like, this is my goal for the day. This is what I hope to do. And then at the end they would record, well, this is what I made today and show off what they made. And each day when they would come back, they would have to report in on two or three other peers projects and give a little bit of feedback like, oh, I really like what you did here. Uh, did you think about trying this? And on the fourth day, they got to actually play their instruments together. And there's one student in particular who really blew me away because she decided that her instrument was going to be a whimsical flute. And what's a whimsical flute? And she, she came <laughs> My in. My favorite there. kind of flute. <laughs> yeah, the best kind of flute. And so what she did is she had all these cool uh, ideas about how it would be, how it would look, how it would sound. And she coded it in Scratch and did some really cool stuff. The, the one day she said, I'm really having trouble making it sound whimsical in her initial. She said, so I'm just going to play around with the code until I find something that works. And so her solution was to make each uh, time she would tap the input on the makey makey, it would play a series of notes. So it would be like doody 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 do instead of just a single note and they would play really fast. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, well, of course, that sounds That's whimsy. whimsical, <laughs> right? And uh, she got some really cool feedback from the other students. One student, uh, told her that she should make the mouthpiece be the ground and that it should be a Twizzler. And then <laughs> followed it up by saying that she should cover it with lightning bolts because lightning bolts make everything better. Yes. 
Of course they do. <laughs> but, but what really so eighth grade. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was actually fourth and fifth graders who made these. This was a few years back. But what yeah. really blew me away is she finished early with her project, and she thought, well, I I've made the flute, and it's just as I pictured it being. And she checked in with me, and I said, well, you've got about 20 minutes, and you can either give feedback to other people, or you can just play around with it and see what hits you. And... I went and checked in on the seesaw at the end of the day, and I was gobsmacked. What she'd <laughs> actually done is she'd created sheet music with, instead of notes, the inputs on the makey-makey, which she'd drawn on the flute itself. So you could see the sheet music and then sort of play this whimsical flute. So she created a song to accompany her device. And I just was astonished, but at the same time I realized this is why you need to make that space mm -hmm. to give the students that extra time to really push the boundaries and explore what they're passionate about. Because when you do that, the sky's the limit. Well, and I think when, when you recognize that, like you, there is no way that you would have planned for all of those different things that she came up with. So I think in a way, this idea of giving the power over to the kids is actually quite liberating for teachers once they feel comfortable setting the conditions. You know, I mean, I think that's probably the thing that people struggle with the most with this idea of student-centered classrooms and, and really the kids kind of driving the learning and where things are going to come from. They're like, but but what about this and what about this and I have to have control over this and where am I going to get my grades and this and how do they show mastery and you know all of these different things but when you've clearly gotten a you've gotten comfortable with the process of what you have to put in place with the kids so that then the kids get to drive that process and you don't have to I mean you are still but you know what I'm saying like I think it's, I think what you're kind of saying is they were, they came up with things that you were amazed by that you couldn't have dreamed of that you would have had them do, you know, um, and a lot of times kids have to do that on their own, um, just like at their own house. If, you know, right. like they have to go to school, then they can get home and maybe come up with something creative or interesting. The fact that they're getting to do that in the school day is I think such um, a gift for the kids. All right, now I want to play the whimsical flute. All right, okay. there is a video of it. Um, I hope Nick <laughs> sends it to us. We can we can push that out. It is the cutest thing and the most amazing. I used it for uh, an in-service opening address last year, uh, just to share some things and and how like even him retelling the story just now. Like I already knew all of that. Um, I'm privileged enough to to know Nick, but. Um, but I still got like chills and got a little like emotional just hearing it because I just think of how powerful that was. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, Nick, it's been uh, awesome having you on the podcast and uh, excellent, excellent stories that I think are going to really inspire a lot of people. And, you know, if they're not sure what to do and they, and they really want to incorporate more maker ed or they, you know, they want to do more maker stuff, I think you've provided an excellent blueprint whether you think you did or not uh, to, to what that could look like in different spaces um, and and that's awesome so with that in mind uh, we do need to wrap up I wish we could go all day but we want to stay as commute friendly as possible as I always say I think every episode um, so uh, in order to wrap up I'm going to stop saying that SO word um, <laughs> and we're going to do the game of stories now um, being uh, the the charitable man that I am or too lazy to go to the living room and grab them. Uh, Mandy is going to lead the game of stories round tonight uh, with uh, with her decks of the personalized PD game of stories cards by the Bretzman Group. I do. While you're queuing the timer, I was just going to say we um, I had the opportunity to present the personalized PD game of stories this week at uh, TCEA, and we. Um, just kind of shared the idea, and then we just passed decks of cards out to the participants in the session, and they played the game. One table was playing Go Fish, 
and answering questions as they played. One table was playing spades. It was awesome. Like they were just full on playing spades. One was um, almost like apples to apples, like where they would, they all gave an answer and then somebody would pick the winner and everybody was doing it differently. But then we just had a big old long Google Doc of every idea, link, extension, everything that was shared out in that session. And the participants drove that whole process of learning and sharing, and it was so fantastic. So um, love this game, love these cards. We actually have the three of clubs, and it says share an app, add-on, or extension. Tell a story about your favorite apps, add-ons, or extensions, and explain how you use them. How does what you use make teaching and learning better? Which have you heard about that you want to try next? Maybe you should just get a group together for Appy Hour and talk about apps. So lots of ideas on the card. You can kind of take it um, how you want. And Nick, we put a minute up on the timer because if not, I talk for 27 additional minutes. So true. It's true. <laughs> All right. When you start, I'll start the time when you start talking. All right. So uh, the app that I'm going to choose, as I've mentioned before, uh, it's Seesaw. And Seesaw, uh, I, I try and like promise like low things, but man, Seesaw may be the best educational app uh, ever invented. Uh, the best analogy I can make for it is it's a lot like Hermione's Time Turner from Harry Potter, because in a sense, you can be everywhere in your classroom at once and go back in time and access it all through your smartphone uh, through the comfort of your own home with a glass of wine later. Uh, you can track student process, you can use it for assessments, you can get student thinking captured, which otherwise you would just have a piece of paper in front of you and you're like, oh man, if only they'd put that extra step there. But in Seesaw, they can talk through the whole process with you. So I, I really think it's a magical tool and I believe it's free if, if that's, I think it's still free, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Basic okay. teacher version is free. Um, I don't know all the details, but I'm pretty sure like the free version, it's like everything. There's a few things like you can get with like a school premium thing, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's cool. Awesome. I hear lots about it. Just got an email from a teacher today who's diving in in sixth grade. Uh, it was one of those things where like my experience with it is kind of, eh, but I keep like promoting it because I hear how awesome it is from everybody else. And like, I'll, I'll dive in, I'll, I'll help figure it out, like whatever it is, but I know it's awesome. And if, if you need this thing, like you keep talking about these things you want. Um, and we finally, finally got them started. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm excited about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the one that I want to talk about to keep up with the musical theme uh, is something that we tried this year um, in our maker space at uh, my intermediate school, grades five and six. Uh, we have these week-long workshop projects. So students come down during the workshop time, which is a half an hour a day. So for a week, they come and work on one project. Fifth graders make stop-motion videos. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, the sixth graders needed a project for this year because they did stop-motion last year. We weren't sure what to do. And then I had a little extra money in my budget uh, with a grant we got from the PTO. So I got Soundtrap licenses. So for all the sixth graders, they come down and they have a week to create things in Soundtrap. And it's amazing because it's such a cool tool for using instruments or mixing in loops or modulating and making your voice go crazy with auto-tune. Uh, but the coolest thing I saw this week reminded me of you, Nick, and your music story. Uh, these students actually wrote their own song with sheet music and played it in Soundtrap, and it was exceptional. Oh, these are good. Now I have more work to do, more things to learn about. It's too much. Growth mindset. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm, I'm ready. You just start. I'll click start. All right. So I have an oldie but a goodie. And because no one else had talked about an extension, I really enjoy the one tab extension. So basically, it's an extension on Chrome. And I will, like, it's been especially helpful at TCEA because I have, every time I'm in a new session, I open up the presentation all the links that we go to during the presentation. So there are 60 tabs open at the top of my computer at the end of the day, and I don't want to shut that down. So then I just click the one tab extension and it collapses every tab that I have open in the browser down to one tab. 
and then I can export it and I can save it as a link, I can send it to myself, I can make it into a QR code, so then like I can just do a one tab for each day of the conference. So I can go back to Monday, pull up day one, and everything that was in that tab, then I can go through on my own time. Exceptional. I love one tab, so I'm glad you shared that one. It's one of my faves. <laughs> um, I abuse it too much, but uh, definitely cool. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that one. Uh, Nick, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I've always found that the more I share, the more I get back. So thank you again. Excellent. Uh, and is there a place where uh, if people wanted to reach out to you about those awesome projects that you have your students doing or wanted to see the video uh, from the GEG winning contest or mm -hmm. just generally just pick your brain about stuff, where can they find you? Uh, so uh, I, I'm still relatively active with my Twitter uh, and I've still got my old college nickname as my Twitter. So I, you can find me at at Rich Man Lobster, which... <laughs> <laughs> that's is a story a for a different story. time right yes that is a story for a different time <laughs> it's an entirely different podcast on behalf of mandy we'd like to thank you again for taking some time to listen to these stories in edu podcast uh, you can find us i think on you probably listen to us on itunes but you might be watching us on youtube uh we're on google play now google play podcast uh i think that's that's where we're at that's probably enough places Pick one of the three, please. Uh, and uh, feel free if you're on iTunes, give us a review. Otherwise, just keep on listening and we'll keep on sharing stories from educators around uh, the country and the world. Take care until the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to the Stories in EDU podcast. Please be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks again.